if the recording is working. Okay, the computer is stuck. Hold on. You like the hot dog? Vitamin? Recording is working. But resume. Okay. Ah, it's working. All right. Good. So the topic of this section is basically protein characterization and modification. So we're going to talk mainly on protein structure and how protein structure impact function. So just as a refresher from food chemistry and then from the quiz that you just <laughs> taken, um, let's remember a few things about basic things about proteins. What of the following is true about the R group? What did you answer, Lynn? Yeah. A and C. So it doesn't always carry charge. Some, some amino acids do carry charge. The R group, not the carboxyl and the amine. So lysine, arginine, histidine, aspartic acid, and um, what? Glutamic acid, yes, thank you. So they carry charge, whereas other R groups don't. OK, so good. And then the R group. The functional groups of the R group determine what interactions within the molecule are going to happen, and these interactions determine secondary and tertiary structure. So that you learned about in food chemistry. So this is just how the amino acid looks like, and the R group is what you have the basic and the acidic, and then the R group determines polarity, whether the amino acid is polar, nonpolar, charged, uh, not charged, hydrophobic, what reactions they're going to be involved in, and all of that impact functionality. And it also, like I said, it impacts structure, the secondary structure, whether it's alpha helix or beta sheet, stabilized by hydrogen bonds, and then the formation of tertiary structure, which is stabilized by hydrogen bond, hydrophobic, covalent, um, electrostatic, and van der Waals. Okay. This one. What did you answer for this one? That wasn't on there? Shoot. What would you answer if it was on there? All, yes, it's all of the above. So the protein functionality, whether it's solubility, if the protein is denatured, solubility is going to go down. If protein is partially denatured, emulsification and foaming is going to be enhanced. Gelation, thermally induced gelation, is uh, induced when the protein is denatured. So functionality is impacted by denaturation. Number of thiol groups, thiol is your s sulfhydryl groups. So if uh, sulfhydryl groups interact via oxidation, you form disulfide linkages, and that can cause obviously polymerization, for example, stabilization of the gluten network, or forming of big polymers and precipitation of a whey protein in a beverage. This whey protein can form disulfide linkages. Um, and of course, the functionality is impacted by the R group. Is it the hydrophobic? Is it polar? Does it have charge? That impacts functionality. We'll give examples throughout the three lectures, of course. Was this on the? 
Yes, all of the above. So the vesicochemical functional properties of the proteins are influenced by amino acid composition. So do we have high percentage of hydrophobic residues, charged residues, a lot of uh, reactive amines such as lysine, surface charge, impact solubility, structural configuration, also impacts functionality. So here's an example of structural configuration. So this is a beta-lactoglobulin away protein. It's a globular structure, compact circular structure, and it has really high surface hydrophilicity. That means it's really negatively charged on the surface and very low hydrophobicity on the surface. Makes it the golden protein for beverages, for high protein beverages, because it's a very soluble protein. It's a small, compact, very hydrophilic protein on the surface. That's a configuration impact. Beta casein is an open structure protein. It has hydrophobic groups exposed as well as hydrophilic groups. Makes it what? What uh, functionality would like to have a protein having a balance between hydrophobic and hydrophilic on the surface? What functional property? Emulsification. So, Beta casein is an, or casein, caseinase in general are excellent emulsifier. We call them natural emulsifiers. Again, this has to do with their structural configuration. Okay. Is this on the test? Okay. The following is true about a protein solubility. B and C. Of course, you don't want high surface hydrophobicity, you want sur high surface hydrophilicity. And then, of course, when you have higher charge, more interaction with water. And then both hydrophobicity and hydrophilicity have a direct bearing on the protein. So the protein can be hydrophobic and hydrophilic on the surface because you might have groups of amino acids on the surface that are hydrophobic <coughs> and groups of amino acids on the surface that are hydrophilic and charged. So the amount of each on the surface impacts solubility. If you have more of one versus the other, then that would impact the solubility in a different direction. Was this on the test? We have to think about it for next year. <laughs> okay. So the following analytical tools can be used to characterize, identify a protein. B and C. All the above. The gel electrophoresis too. Okay. So with MS you can determine amino acid sequence, you can identify a protein. With IR spectroscopy, you can look at secondary and tertiary structure of the protein. With the gel electrophoresis, you can look at individual units of a protein. If they were changed by hydrolysis, you can see that. If you have polymerization, they would, you would see high, uh, high molecular weight polymers on the top of the gel. So you can use any of these techniques to characterize. Okay. So... In the lab, you'll be working with uh, protein ingredients, doing some structural and functional testing, and doing some modifications as well, and looking at impact on functionality and structure. So protein ingredients is the theme. So of course, um, they're very important ingredients, and the, the demand for protein is increasing and is going at a really high rate. The increase or the demand for proteins is going at a high rate. Anybody knows why is that trend? Why people are asking for more protein in their diet? Yeah? So it's a bigger push to be more active. Okay. Sam? Low calorie diet, high protein. But proteins carry calories as well. Mm -hmm. no. 
So filling, filling aspect, yes. Also, how do you define the foreign efficiency program? So that would be good for public efficiency. Yeah, but for, uh, yes. Yes, okay, so, <laughs> yeah, but no, at the same time. So, protein is known as healthy component of the diet. So, so far, there hasn't been anything negative about the protein. So, there might be carbohydrate associated with diabetes and obesity, and, of course, fat is associated with heart disease and obesity, and sugars from carbohydrates as well. So, but proteins, they've been associated with health benefits so far. So, now that's the demand, going to a high protein diet rather than a high carbohydrate or high fat diet. So, consuming more protein for, from a health perspective and getting the energy or the calories intake from protein rather than getting it from, from carbohydrates and fat. So, the demand for protein in addition to ha leading a healthy, active life as well, so you require protein to regenerate muscles, proteins for satiety. So there's all this uh, demand for protein coming from these aspects that proteins are good, they're good for you. So other than regular protein ingredients that are isolates, you, iso you isolate the protein from different sources and you name them as isolates or concentrate based on the concentration of the protein. You also have a very common ingredient that is protein hydrolysate. So there is like whey protein isolate and concentrate, there's whey protein hydrolysate as well. So a protein is hydrolyzed for a specific purpose to enhance digestibility of the protein, to um, enhance certain functionality of the protein. So you can use that as an ingredient. So in the lab, you'll be, some of you will be working with isolates, others will be working with hydrolysate, and you will also be producing hydrolysate uh, in the lab. So there are many different ways that you can characterize a protein. Um, can you name some? When we say characterize a protein, what do we really mean? What do we look in a protein in order to characterize it? Can you say something? Functionality. functionality, definitely. Solubility. Solubility under functionality. Denaturation. Change in structure, denaturation, yes. Size. Molecular size. What else? Charge. Surface properties, charge, hydrophobicity. Anything else you can think of? Well, let's see from what you have. So amino acid composition and sequence. So it's not just the composition, how much of lysine you have or alanine you have, but also in what sequence. The sequence determine the structure, the secondary structure and the tertiary structure, and also the overall configuration of the protein and uh, functionality. So composition and sequence. Some of you said, Okay. Some of you said molecular weight and molecular configuration. So you have the size, the molecular weight, and how the protein is shaped. Is it a globular? Is it an open structure? So that impacts the size. Size is not only impacted by molecular weight, it's impacted by the structure. So the protein might be open structure. It will seem large but it might have the same molecular weight to another protein that is circular and globular in structure. Some of you said charge, so surface properties, so net charge, isoelectric points, surface hydrophobicity, some said denaturation, functional properties, solubility is one, emulsification, gelation, even biological activity, bioactivity of a protein or physiological benefit of the protein, uh, physical, it could be the color that is contributed by the protein, uh, could be the flavor. So all of these are different characteristics. So we'll be talking about different methods to determine these characteristics and then how these characteristics can impact function. 
So, and we'll talk about methods for function ads. So, like I said, the whole point of this three lectures is how to relate structure to function. And how can we modify structure to change a function? So we'll be focusing on protein structure and function. So what impacts structure, you have intrinsic factors. We talked about that in food chemistry. We talked about the compos amino acid composition and amino acid sequence, how much uh, ionizable groups and reactive groups you have in the protein, the hydrophobicity, total percent hydrophobicity and the hydrophobicity on the surface, and the net charge. And the different protein sources, whether it's from milk or soy or wheat or any other source, they differ. And, and in the lab, you're going, some of you are going to be working with soy, some with whey, some with casein, egg protein. I don't know if there's pea protein as yeah. well. Okay. But we can, okay. we can say, yeah, it's pea protein. Yeah, but now, I mean, pea protein is very common. They know, they should know it's pea protein. So these characteristics, the intrinsic factors, impact the native structure of the protein. So the native meaning the protein after post-translational modification, that's how the protein is before any changes or processing. Then there is the extrinsic factors we talked about that in food chemistry, the different environmental factors, pH, temperature, ionic strength, how it will impact the maturation of the protein, and then the different processing, whether you heat, use solvent, and during storage, what would happen to the protein structure. What we didn't talk about in food chemistry, we'll talk about here, is modification of the protein. We're going to select two prominent modification methods and look at how it's impacting structure and how it will impact function. So basically, going from native, we go with the presence of extrinsic factors, you end up having either a denatured structure or a modified structure of the protein, and that will impact function. Okay, so you go from native to denatured or modified, the functionality will be impacted, whether it's taste or flavor, color, interaction with water, we call that hydration, so that would be solubility, water holding capacity, and then surface properties that impact emulsification and foaming, and then structural, that means physical change in the structure as in viscosity, gelation, or viscoelasticity. So changes from native to modified or denatured will impact all of those either negatively or positively. So we induce modification to actually improve or target a certain functionality, and we'll give example to that. So just to keep in mind, these intrinsic factor and extrinsic factors will impact protein structure. And when we say protein structure, what we mean is the molecular configuration. Is the protein that was um, globular and compact is it going to unfold and open up and becomes a random structure? That is a molecular configuration change. Are we going to hydrolyze the protein? That's going to be impacting molecular size. Um, how are we going to change the protein? The protein might interact with the sugar or reducing sugar. That will impact molecular association and interaction. Okay. And then surface properties of the protein in terms of charge and hydrophobicity, that might impact uh, solubility, for example, and emulsification and foam. Okay, so when we talk about factors that impact structure, structure would be these um, components. Okay, so what I would like to spend some time on is giving you real examples. Uh, from my experience in working in, in, in industry for a little bit at Cargill. So what I did there is I worked with their protein ingredients, right? And then I've seen so many different examples, how to relate structure to function, and when is structure important. So I'm just going to give you real life examples, okay? So why monitoring structure, ch structure changes is important from an industry and practical uh, point of view. 
Okay, so during processing, for example, so if, the, if you need to formulate a beverage, right, so you want to pasteurize this pe beverage. Pasteurization is heat treatment. So it's a combination of heat, temperature, and time. So different proteins denature at different temperatures and, and different time exposure to certain temperature for a prolonged time will cause probably denaturation, then polymerization, then precipitation. So then, then you end up with a beverage on the shelf that will protein sediment over time and you as a consumer, you come and look at the beverage and you go, no, the protein is sedimented, it looks separated, phase separation, you don't like that. So you need to monitor changes in protein denaturation and polymerization during processing of whatever product you are formulating. You're formulating a beverage, you're formulating a protein bar. So you want to monitor the stages of processing and how it impacts the protein. If you find that one protein is susceptible to certain combination of temperature and time that you're using, you might go say, I don't want to work with pea protein. I want to work with whey protein or Maybe even not both of them, maybe soy protein would be better for your type of formulation. Soy protein has higher denaturation temperature, for example, than whey protein. So you can, based on your formulation and processing and how the structure is impacted, you can determine what protein ingredient you can use and therefore, or you can also modify your processing conditions to preserve the structure and preserve the function of the protein. So that's one example. Valorization, that means increasing a value to something that has low value or low market value, that is. One very good example to that is when they make cheese, okay? When you make cheese, you are forming the curd and you're taking the curd and you're processing the curd to, to get your cheese. What's the byproduct? Whey. So, Several years ago, whey was a waste product. It was thrown away or used as um, animal feed. And somebody said, we're producing tons and tons of this whey product. Let's look into it and see what, what's in this whey that we can utilize and increase the value of. So they looked at the whey and they found, wow, it has pretty good protein in there has beta-lactoglobulin mainly and alpha-lactalbumin, looked at the nutritional profile, protein digestibility, and amino acid composition, perfect protein, looked at functionality, they found it to be excellent protein in terms of solubility, okay? Then remove the lactose, remove the water and the mineral, and you end up with a protein isolate, which is now among the most expensive protein ingredients. So they went from a really a waste to a really high value ingredient. So how did they find that out? By looking at the structure of the protein and the function of the protein in that waste. And they find value for it and they found applications for it. Okay, protein separation. So you hear me say protein ingredients. Okay, how do we get these protein ingredients? So you have a complex food matrix or a produce that you need to extract the protein out of it. So let's talk about uh, Soy protein, uh, how do we get soy protein out of soy bean? Any simple idea of how do you get the protein isolate from soy? Any process, do you cover that in processing at all or anywhere? No? No? It's okay, I mean, I, I'm not examining you, but I'm just wondering. What? Yeah. Well, at least you said the very important key step. So soybean is an oil seed, and it's mainly 50 years ago. It mainly was used <coughs> for oil to just get the oil out, and the meal was used as animal feed. That's actually another example for valorization. So 50 years ago or more, the, you take the oil and the meal that is very rich in protein goes to animal feed. And then soon they realize, what are we doing? This is a high value product. We can use it for human consumption and increase the value. But 
To get to the protein, there are so many processing steps. So before, before oil pressing, there is something we call flaking. So you get the soybean, and then you have to flake it and then press it. So in order to flake it, you need to heat it a little bit just to, ma to make it mechanically possible to flake it. And then after flaking, there's the, another heating step so that the oil is released from the tissues when you press, so the heat helps with that. So there is another heating step to press and release the oil. And then after that, you get the oil out, and then you end up with something we call cake. So the cake still has fat because the pressing does not allow all the fat to come out or the oil to come out. So there's still about 10 to 15 percent oil. So you really need to get that oil out because obviously you want all the oil, every single drop, out to utilize. So how do we do that with hexane treatment? So there's solvent treatment, solvent impact protein structure. So there is solvent treatment to remove the remaining oil, and then you end up with the meal. So we have cake, solvent treatment, and then meal. But there is also residual solvent. You, they would dry that solvent. So there is a drying step, heating. So heating will impact protein structure. Okay. So there is that heating step to remove the solvent, and then you end up with the meal. From there, to remove the fiber, there is no starch in soybean. So there is the fiber to separate the fiber from the protein. There is pH extraction, and they do that to solubilize the protein. But that doesn't impact the protein structure. What impacts the protein structure is all of these preliminary steps that they have to do to remove the oil. So the heating, flaking, pressing, and then solvent extraction, and then desolvatinization. So all of these steps impact the protein structure. And if the structure of the protein is impacted, the functionality is impacted. So they look at every step <coughs> during protein separation to, um, to preserve the structure. How can they change the, the processing or modify the processing parameters to preserve the structure? So this is well known in soybeans, but there are new oil seeds that are coming up that they want to utilize the protein out of them, not just from soy, from other components like canola, for example. So again, in industry currently, they're looking at ways of extracting oil from canola and preserving the protein. So whatever they discovered in soy, they're now looking at different um, protein sources. Comparison to competitors. So one project I worked on was to help um, Cargill address customers' <coughs> questions. So Cargill has customers. Their customers are people like General Mills and PepsiCo. They buy their ingredients, and they formulate uh, products with them. So they would go, why do we want to buy your ingredient versus Roquette ingredients or Kasukra or whatever other company? or um, DSM or whatever. So in order to help them understand how their product or the ingredient of Cargill is different than a different com competitor, we look at the structure function of each of these ingredients from different competitors. Change in functionality. Another, another project that I worked on there, which was very interesting, is they've changed a cooker. They were producing soy flour, and the old cooker is dying out, so they wanted to put in a new cooker to heat up the flour. And they noticed that with the new cooker, the color is brown, more brown than the old cooker flour. So, and they were concerned, does this browning mean this product is being heated more for longer time? How would that impact the protein? because this product was going to fermentation um, utilization. So if the protein has been impacted in a way where the yeast cannot ferment or use it anymore, then it's potentially a problem. So we looked at old versus new cooker and looked at how that structure was different and how the function was different. Functional enhancement, which, which is a big deal, especially for plant proteins. So everybody wants plant protein now. They don't, people are vegan, they're looking for non-allergen, um, just for health reasons, 
not wanting uh, animal sources. But plant proteins are not good, bottom line. Not good in terms of functionality. So they want to use plant protein, but they don't function as egg protein or wheat protein, or, or sorry, milk protein. So we're looking at ways to modify the structure of the protein to make it function better. Last is interactions with other constituents. So proteins are not present in a void. So there is a food matrix that it's complex. So obviously you have your water, you have your fat, you have your carbohydrate in there. So interactions proteins with the different components impact the structure and the function of the food. So that's another looking at the interactions and how these interactions impact function. One example of a system that is um, very complex is an, an encapsulated uh, system in capsules to encapsulate, let's say, fish oil. So you have to start with a stable emulsion, and then you use that emulsion with dextrin to form an, a capsule. So you have water, you have oil, you have protein, you have carbohydrate. They're all interacting together to form a stable capsule. So how they interact and what you want to put in what ratio impact the final product and the stability of the final product. So back to this. So with now some examples. So what time do we have? Let's go. Okay, we have 10 minutes. All right. So, um, so now that we talked about some examples where structure and function uh, are related, so we'll talk, let's talk about some methods to determine or to characterize proteins. So there are so many methods. We're going to select a few and talk about a few. And few of the few you'll do in the lab. So this is kind of a summary table that I put together to summarize the most used methods to characterize proteins. So there are chemical assays as analytical tools, and there are instrument methods that you would use in certain instruments to characterize proteins. So one important characterization tool is the electrophoresis. And you're going to do that in the lab. You're going to do uh, SDS phage electrophoresis. With electrophoresis, what's the purpose of that? Is to look at individual subunits of a protein. Because usually a protein ingredient, an isolate, is not one single type of a protein. There are multiple different types of proteins within that one unit. And you will also look at uh, polymerization. So is this protein you're starting with had been abused by heat, for example? Protein has been denatured. It's been polymerized. So you can see polymer formation. So individual proteins, polymer formation. Or if you're looking at a hydrolysate, so you're going to hydrolyze a protein, or one, one group will have a protein hydrolysate. You'll be looking at which proteins subunits got hydrolyzed and then you will monitor uh, that as well. This, the molecular side changes upon hydrolysis. So polymerization, protein subunits, changes upon hydrolysis. You can do that by one-dimensional or two-dimensional. But in the lab, you're going to do one-dimensional electrophoresis. Two-dimensional electrophoresis, we talk about that in food analysis. I'm not going to repeat that here. So. Do you remember the difference between these three? Mallory remembers something. <laughs> Can you clarify? So what's the difference between SDS and urea? So OK. SDS, it's called SDS polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis because you actually use a buffer that has SDS in it. And the SDS, the sodium dedusted sulfide, what it does is 
it interacts with the protein. It, it breaks down bonding, so it breaks down hydrophobic, uh, I mean non-covalent interaction, hydrophobic, electrostatic, and hydrogen bonding. And also it imparts a negative charge on the surface of the protein. So all the proteins in your sample will have a net negative charge. Then when you run them on the gel, they will be separated only on the basis of size, molecular size. So in the lab, you're going to run SDS page, and you'll notice that caseins don't react, don't, are not, how do I say that? Should I tell them, or they will have to figure that out, the question in the lab? Usually, even if you tell them now, they'll be forgotten. forgotten? You have no faith in us. <laughs> I was going to say that. I'm writing it down. <laughs> <laughs> Get it, ma'am. So the casein, they act as if they're very large proteins, although molecular weight based, they're not very large proteins, but they're open structure. So they don't migrate the same way you would expect a globular protein to migrate. So they will seem to be larger than they actually are in terms of molecular weight. So that's why for casein specifically, people use urea page. And not just that, you have, in casein, you have four different caseins. You have the kappa casein, beta casein, alpha S1, and alpha S2 caseins. They all are very similar in molecular weight and size, but they differ in charge. So if you run a gel on SDS page, you might not be able to separate them well from each other. But if you run urea gel, you can separate all four because urea separates based on size to charge ratio or charge to size ratio. And then urea is used, and urea usually mostly breaks hydrogen bonding, and by breaking hydrogen bonding, it might result in breaking other bonding. Native page, by the name of it, you just run it and without denaturing the protein. So you will look at the native state of the protein. Usually it's really hard to differentiate proteins and subunits if you don't do anything to it because you, they might not separate. So this is the unit that you'll be working with. You will have a cassette and in that cassette there is a gel and then you will load in each well, you will load your sample and you will run, run it using voltage. So all of them are going to go down. Um, they're all negatively charged, so they go from negative to positive when you run a current. So they're all going to go down the gel and separate based on size. After the separation is done, you're not going to see anything. It's still going to be a clear uh, gel. You're only going to see the front line of your Lemley buffer, which has a blue, um, is it Kumasi? I don't know what dye it is. And then um, you break it, you take out the gel, you stain it, and then destain, and then you will have a gel with the different subunits of the proteins that you will be characterizing and looking at. So what's an example where you use the Huh? I never used it because I feel it's useless. <laughs> but, you know, sometimes you want to look at the protein in native, but you do have to do a complementary. So you will run a native gel, and then you run an SDS gel, and you see how the protein. The, yeah, and then you will see when you run a gel, okay, what did, what, that might give you an indication of some molecular interactions between proteins when you run them in the native state versus when you denature them, what you will see. Sometimes you have hydrophobic interaction polymers formed by hydrophobic interactions. You won't be able to see them with SDS page because you're breaking the hydrophobic interactions. If you run the native, you'll see polymers, and then when you run an SDS page, you won't see them. So if you're really looking closely at what interactions, you might want to do two or three of these. Good question. All right. So sometimes when you run STS page, and you will be doing that in the lab, especially for the people that are doing soy or pea protein, you have to use a reducing agent. 
why is that? So with, when you add a reducing agent in the lab, we use beta mercaptoethanol. So you're going to break disulfide linkages. And why is it important to do that for some proteins? Here's an example. So this is soy protein in nature. Soy protein is really a complex quaternary structure. So if you remember from your food chemistry, there is tertiary structure, and then after that, there is quaternary structure, where multiple protein polymers associate. So soy protein in nature associate together. So you have a, a dimer is formed with this red line is a disulfide linkage. So you have a acidic and basic subunits bound together by sulfide linkage. And then you have hydrophobic interaction and then you have hydrogen bonding that keeps them all together and they're about 300 kilodalton in size. They're really large molecule. Okay? So if you run that on a gel as such, this is what you're going to get, a smearing. You won't see anything. It's a large molecule, and then several of them are bound by disulfide linkages. You won't see separation. So soy protein and pea protein are similar in that way. So we add beta mercaptoethanol. Then we run it on the gel. The beta mercaptoethanol is going to break the disulfide linkages, and then you're going to see the subunits individually. So then you will have a clearer idea of what's in there. And you don't piece it back together. You don't piece it back together. Once it's broken, well, like it's broken. Figure out what yeah, you piece it back together in terms of okay. So now this yeah. is beta lactoglobulin. This is not beta lactoglobulin beta conglycinin, sorry, beta conglycinin in soy, beta lactoglobin is in whey, and then glycinin subunits. And then if you hydrolyze, for example, you can see clearly the enzyme targeted glycinin versus conglycinin. If you hydrolyze and you load like this, you won't be able to see clearly what the enzyme hydrolyzed, for example. And I know it's time, so I'll see you later. Oh my gosh. Uh.